Boxer engines and Subaru have been inseparable for most of this Japanese brand's life. In recent years though, some have begun to question whether this flat 4 format really has a place in the industry's largely electrified future. Subaru wants to assure us that it does, hence the full hybrid e-boxer petrol unit fitted to this 5th generation Forester. This SK series model also gets a much stiffer platform, a considerably classier cabin and even more capable off-road ability via its symmetrical four-wheel drive system and X-mode drive settings. But you'll still need to be very much a Subaru loyalist to really like it. Wouldn't it be nice to find a properly capable mid-sized family SUV? A car that could walk the walk as well as talking the talk. Well, a car like this one, Subaru's fifth generation Forester, now enhanced with an e-boxer full hybrid petrol powertrain. Everything about this design seems to be nicely balanced, from the shape and positioning of its freshly electrified boxer engine to the shape and positioning of its intended clientele people who want something fashionable but who don't need to make a fashion statement, people who want something that's tough and rugged but don't need to tackle the Rubicon Trail. So the smartest styling inside and out will go down just as well as the symmetrical all-wheel drive system and the symmetrical off-road technology. In this Mark V form, this Forester is very much a mid-sized SUV, but in its first two generations of life, this model was simply an all-wheel drive estate, albeit a very capable one. The first generation SF series car of 1997 and its successor, the SG series model of 2002, satisfied the kind of market that Subaru has also long catered to with its Outback station wagon. Perhaps wary of continued duplication alongside that car, the Japanese maker uh, gave the Forester more of a raised crossover vibe in its third generation SH form of 2008, a theme further developed with the fourth generation SJ series version of 2012. That was usefully updated three years later. What we're looking at here though with the Mark V SK series model launched in late 2019 is the most fundamental change in Forester design we've seen yet. The key thing that Subaru wants to talk about this time around is the fact that this car, like their smaller XV crossover, is now using a proper full hybrid version of the brand's classic flat four boxer petrol power plant. This engine designated the e-boxer. Just as significant is the news that this fifth generation Forester is the third of the company's modern era models to sit on its latest Subaru Global Platform, a chassis that we first saw back in 2016, underpinning the Mark V version of its Impreza family hatch, and then subsequently also in the second generation version of the XV small SUV. The chassis has made this car stronger and more sophisticated, most notably in the way that the floor plan can now accommodate the company's advanced EyeSight driver assist technology. What hasn't changed though is the way that you buy a Forester for what it does, not for what it says about you. Talk to almost any former owner and they'll tell you about times when they cruised past other similar vehicles that came unstuck, when the going got tough. Uh, they'll tell you that nothing ever fell off, that nothing ever went wrong and that absolutely nothing would persuade them to buy anything else. All of that would be great for Subaru's UK importers if there were a lot of these kinds of people, but there aren't. So this SK series model has to satisfy the brand loyalists while also reaching out to a wider audience, people who've never owned a Subaru before. We are sensing the possibility of a bit of an uphill struggle in meeting that brief, but that is just the kind of thing that this Forester claims to have been designed for. Let's put it to the test. It's a critical question and we ask it every time we test a car. What is this product trying to be? 
Now, most website and magazine journalists don't seem to start at that point, which is why you'll find those who've bothered to test this Forester carping that it doesn't handle as sharply as an ordinary upper mid-sized SUV. Now, as you'll see later in this film, despite its trumpeted new full hybrid tech, it isn't as efficient to run as one of those either. But then a Forester isn't trying to be ordinary. It's trying to deliver the sport utility capability that Subaru thinks cars of this kind should have. And if that can be done with a modicum of efficiency, then so much the better. Such is the thinking behind this Forester e-boxer. It's a car that aims to break a few stereotypes. Proper SUVs aren't usually full hybrids, as this Subaru now is, and that's because full hybrid engines don't normally have the torque to tow properly, and because they usually sit within a body structure which is placed as near to the ground as possible for eco-efficient aerodynamics. Uh, that's the worst possible setup for off-road use, and it's something that the engineers who created this model weren't prepared to consider. A full hybrid also certainly wouldn't uh, usually lug around the extra weight of a permanent four-wheel drive system either but again that's what's on offer here uh, once you appreciate all of that you'll be less minded to complain about the slight compromises in overall tarmac drivability that come as part and parcel of Forester motoring in choosing such a car, you've got to be the kind of person who's unafraid to go against the grain, and most Forester owners enjoy doing just that. Journalists like us might reference this model's two closest D-segment SUV competitors, hybrid all-wheel drive versions of the Honda CR-V and Toyota's RAV4. A well-informed Subaru buyer, though, would probably laugh at comparisons like that and point out that the CR-V can tow along just 750 kilos, a Forester can log along up to 1870 kilos and the RAV4 sits just 195 mils from the ground. A Forester elevates itself 220 mils from terra firma. This Subaru then is in a different league when it comes to capability and no part of which has been diluted by the addition of e-boxer hybrid tech. In describing that, we have, as usual, to start with a bit of terminology clarification, since the term hybrid is banded about so much when it comes to cars these days, uh, as are references to electrification. In opting to add full hybrid tech to its classic flat four boxer engine, Subaru's picked a middle ground here. Uh, the self-charging full hybrid tech incorporated into this e-boxer power plant delivers a far higher level of electrical assistance than does uh, alternative so-called MH. HEV or mild hybrid technology. That's the sort of thing that you'll get in this class, for instance, in a Ford Cougar. And that sees a normal combustion engine only very marginally electrified by a tiny battery uh, positioned under the rear seat. But the full hybrid format doesn't use a battery that's large enough to support external charging or lengthy periods of full EV driving. For that, you'll need a pricey PHEV tech. But if you get it incorporated into this kind of upper mid-sized D-segment SUV, you'll have to pay much more than Subaru is asking here. Inevitably, all three of these hybrid drive solutions have their ardent supporters. Ford will tell you that mild hybrid tech is an ideal compromise. Mitsubishi reckon nothing beats a plug-in PHEV. And Honda and Toyota have long championed the self-charging full hybrid concept. Plus, it won't be long before the completely battery-powered full EV technology you can have in the segment for large luxury SUVs is commonplace in the kind of class that this Subaru sits in. In other words, before setting off for the showroom, make your own mind up as to what sort of drivetrain solution suits you best. Otherwise, you'll probably have it made up for you. Uh, now, if it helps, our brief summary is that a full EV still has a stigma of range anxiety, Mild hybrid tech doesn't make much of a difference and the PHEV route is expensive and won't pay off unless you regularly engage in the hassle of plugging in. So, like Subaru, we're pretty comfortable with the full hybrid concept, although we are disappointed that it doesn't seem to have been developed very much since we first saw this kind of engine under the bonnet of a Toyota Prius at the turn of the century. 
The electrified part of the e-boxer terminology employed here isn't much different to the IMMD setup of a Honda CRV hybrid or the hybrid dynamic 4 system found in the Toyota RAV4 in that it only allows for about a mile of full electric driving and that's only if you can stay below 25 miles an hour and you've selected the most eco-conscious of the three available driving settings, EV driving mode. Even with this activated, in practice it's very difficult to keep the engine in shut down for even a very brief amount of time and it's certainly all a far cry from the 25 to 30 mile EV range that you'll get from a comparably priced plug-in hybrid model. Still you don't have the hassle here of continually having to attach a dirty charging lead to the mains and this self-charging hybrid setup is certainly very clever in the way that it seamlessly shunts between electric and petrol power as you drive in the motor assist driving setting that you'll be using most frequently in this Forester. Uh, the third mode, engine driving, sees the car driven solely by its 150 PS 2 litre direct injection petrol engine. Ah yes, now the flat four engine. It's the only power plant on offer, the brand long ago dumped diesel, and as always, it's at the heart of what any Subaru stands for. Now the Japanese maker has founded its reputation on the low centre of gravity offered by a horizontally opposed or boxer style power plant where the cylinders lay flat on their sides, uh, the pistons travelling towards each other like the fists of two pugilists. It's a unique selling point uh, that you notice every time you start up and you You'll immediately remark on the gruffly soundtrack which is common to everything the company makes. Flat 4 by the way uh, means exactly that. The unique layout of the engine means that it's flatter and it can be mounted lower down and it improves four-wheel drive, road holding and tarmac stability too thanks to an ultra low centre of gravity that just wouldn't be achievable with a conventional power plant. It's all part of Subaru's commitment to the different level of 4x4 technology which is delivered by the symmetrical all-wheel drive system which, as we suggested earlier, is key to the whole Forester experience. Most so-called four-wheel drive rivals don't actually travel in four-wheel drive very much of the time. Instead, they use cheaper on-demand setups that add in extra rear-wheel traction only when it's absolutely necessary to do so and, crucially, only after grip has been lost with the road surface. Office. With Subaru's symmetrical four-wheel drive system, uh, you have a simple, balanced, permanent distribution of power to all wheels at the same time, and that can stop traction from being lost in the first place, particularly when the car is on steep or tilting terrain. Now, on that subject, uh, if you happen to be interested, there's a 22.9 degree approach angle, a 24.6 degree departure angle, and a 19.6 degree ramp breakover angle. Torque is distributed with a 60-40 bias to the front and there's no user input needed and no buttons to press. Well, not to activate four-wheel drive anyway. Uh, there is a control that you can activate to further enhance its effectiveness. Uh, that for the X-Mode system that we first saw on the previous generation version of this car. X-Mode works as would a conductor in charge of an orchestra, uh, bringing together all the Forester's different engineering elements to work more harmoniously together for more confident navigation across slippery surfaces. Uh, now, in this case, that means coordination of the symmetric electrical four-wheel drive system with throttle response, uh, transmission changes and this Subaru's various braking and stability orientated electronic systems. That includes hill descent control for easing you down steep slippery slopes. Now previously all of this was incorporated into a single setting but with this SK series fifth generation Forester you now get two options, deep snow mud for off-road surfaces where the tyres can become buried such as in deep snow or in dry dirt and snow dirt uh, for use on slippery road surfaces like snow and gravel. The ability to better deal with testing tarmac will of course be a greater buying incentive for likely Forester buyers. After all, you won't want to be attacking the Serengeti in this car, but a rural owner might well come across deep snow, 
towing challenges or winter floods. Uh, this car can wade through 500 millimeters of water. Now to give you some perspective there, uh, referencing other similarly sized SUVs in this class, a Mercedes GLC can only wade through 300 mils of water and somewhat unbelievably, a Skoda Kodiak is limited to 180 millimeters. Uh, the Lineatronic CVT Auto gearbox that you have to have in every Subaru these days is also engineered to help you across testing terrain. It's designed to preserve the kind of momentum which is often lost during uh, gear changes with either a manual box or with traditional automatic transmission. It's difficult to judge just how much of a real tractional difference that makes. What we do know though is that uh, like all CVT transmissions, this one takes its time to spool up and respond when instant acceleration is called for. So your overtakes will need to be planned well in advance. That and the near 1.7 tonne curb weight explain why in normal motoring this car doesn't feel as rapid as the official performance stats suggest. Uh, for reference, the C62 supposedly achievable uh, in 11.8 seconds from rest en route to 117 miles an hour. Now to get anywhere near uh, replicating those readings, you'll need to engage the more dynamic of the two SI drive modes that Subaru provides for tarmac territory. Yes, more modes, uh, which in this case are activated by pushing down on the X mode controller rather than twisting it. Uh, I is for intelligent, that's the one you'll usually default to, but if you're running a bit late, there is an alternative S or sport setting which tweaks throttle response, gear change timings, and steering feel that extra bit. Unsurprisingly, given its high ride height, this Forester does feel a tad uncomfortable being driven in that kind of fashion. Uh, you'd sense it really would be a roly-poly thing if it wasn't for the lower centre of gravity enabled by the flat four engine configuration we mentioned earlier. Also helping here is the extra chassis tautness made possible by this fifth generation model's adoption of the latest Subaru Global Platform, a chassis that's claimed to be a massive 40% stiffer than that of the previous generation model. Even as it is, uh, you won't want to be chucking this car about too much through the turns if you don't want your passengers to start feeling as green as the propaganda for the e-boxer engine. But you won't want to be doing that anyway because there's really not a massive amount of feedback through the steering here. None of which will bother a likely Forester owner in the slightest. These people will enjoy the pleasingly absorbent suspension, which, helped by this SK series model's more sophisticated underpinnings, deals very effectively with tarmac tears, speed humps, and faster highway undulations. And although you are always aware of the gravelly engine note, refinement at highway speeds is acceptably quiet for an SUV of this relatively luxurious status. You might well feel that to have achieved all of that at the same time as creating a properly capable off-roader is quite an achievement, and we wouldn't disagree. You just have to know what you're buying here, and as we said at the beginning, uh, you have to understand what this car is trying to be. Now, everything may have changed with this fifth generation model in terms of its styling, its chassis, and its engine, but when it comes down to it, nothing is really very different, and Subaru folk wouldn't have it any other way. Subaru wants this car to sell alongside sleek, premium badged upper mid-sized SUVs and with that aim in mind has restyled this fifth generation SK series Forester uh, to look a little less chunky and utilitarian. Yet it is still clearly a car which would be as at home on the lower slopes of Ben Nevis as it would be in Belgravia. Loyal owners wouldn't want anything less. Foresters are very SUV-like these days, and that's worth saying because the early first and second generation models were merely all-wheel drive estate cars. The change into the higher-riding crossover genre happened with the Mark III model of 2008, and ever since then this car has been getting progressively larger, to the point where it no longer competes with C-segment cash car class models, and it's now pitched against slightly larger mid-sized D-segment contenders like RAV4s and Honda 
Honda CRVs. Plus, it's also big enough to be a realistic alternative to that Audi Q5, BMW X3, or Mercedes GLC you might have been considering. Uh, you can see that here in profile. This car is now well over 4.6 meters long, uh, 30 mils longer than its SJ series predecessor. As before, the roof line curves downwards towards the rear, and in true SUV fashion, uh, you get roof rails, black plastic clad wheel arches and chunky side sills. Uh, the panel work is more strongly contoured though and this time around uh, to suit current zeitgeist the wheels are a size larger or at least they are on this top premium spec model anyway. Uh, this replaces the uh, base model's 17 inch alloys with larger 18 inch rims. Uh, more prominent changes feature at the front here where strong character lines across the high set bonnet flow into this smarter hexagonal chrome framed front grille which is now flanked by uh, sleeker full LED headlights that automatically turn with the steering, level themselves with heavy loads and dip themselves at night. Uh, owners of the previous generation model will also notice the way that the narrow front slits which characterise the bumper corners of that car have been replaced here by these larger outlets on each side incorporating BD LED fog lamps. As usual with this car, there's a silvered lower skid plate to emphasise its SUV credentials. At the rear, you'll find restyled tail lamps separated by a wide black central panel which aims to emphasise this fifth generation model's 20mm increase in width. There's an integrated roof spoiler and a lower silver skid plate that curves around the exhaust pipe. Of course, what's more significant is the stuff that you can't see, and in this case, it's very significant indeed. This SK Series Forester gets the billion dollar Subaru Global Platform that we first saw showcased by this company's fifth generation Impreza family hatch. It's a chassis that's a massive improvement on the old SJ Series version's rather crude underpinnings. As a result, the body is now 40% stronger, and that's an impressive figure, although it does rather rather make you wonder about the solidity of the previous model. That's all hugely important and some of the changes that Subaru has made to this Forester's interior. Time to take a look at that. Uh, a little surprisingly, given this car's relatively generous 220 millimetres of ground clearance, this isn't one of those SUVs that you have to climb up into. Instead, there's a relatively low hit point that older buyers will probably appreciate. And once inside, well, let's be frank, the cabin of the previous version of this model uh, felt pretty down market in comparison to the posher crossover models in this segment that Subaru now wants to compete with. Now, this interior might not immediately bring to mind premium brand standards of quality, but overall, it's a huge improvement, especially with the supple leather upholstery that features as part of this top premium trim level. Uh, there are some lovely touches here too, like the hold aluminium look pedals and the stitching and chrome highlights around the edges of the lower centre console. Someone at Subaru has finally realised that the showroom interior experience the car can offer is just as vital to selling it as any engineering technology it might have. Now, if you've switched over from a German premium model, though, you might find the cabin style approach, although interesting, uh, somewhat inconsistent. Uh, take the dash design ahead of the front seat passenger, where within a few inches, you have no fewer than four different trim finishes from grained plastic up to stitched faux leather and onto a rubberized coating and then stitched soft plastic. There's an awful lot going on. The key dash architecture changes made here over the previous generation model lie on the centre stack where the vents have been repositioned either side of the infotainment screen which has grown in size to 8 inches. Now this monitor uh, now uses a far classier user interface and although there's no lower rotary controller you do at least get physical shortcut buttons um, beneath the touch screen and it also incorporates smartphone mirroring for Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. 
As you expect, it is also the portal from which you access the six-speaker DAB stereo system and the usual phone and media features, uh, as well as the satellite navigation setup that you'll find, of course, fitted to this premium variant. Uh, the screen offers a smartphone-style swipe and pinch control function for map displays, and it houses a standard-fit rear-view camera, which offers a super-wide 160-degree field of view behind the car when you're reversing. Voice control is standard and owners will also be able to download a wide range of apps. Aha, for example, uh, which will enable you to stream music, information, social media and other data services. Other manufacturers would also build the various vehicle informational functions that you'll need into such a monitor, but Subaru continues to prefer to separate these into a separate smaller color screen at the top of the center stack. Uh, from this now smarter display, you use a steering wheel mounted info button to oversee a whole range of things. Uh, for example, an energy monitor showing driveline status and the various eyesight safety systems. Plus, there's a clock, navigation and audio screens, uh, a trip computer and acceleration readouts, and a useful off-road orientated screen which shows you the current body angle and the ongoing status of the symmetrical four-wheel drive system with your chosen X-mode setting. Earlier we mentioned the reversing camera, well it's also really neat the way that this upper display shows a different camera perspective from that featuring on the main monitor when you're moving backwards. Anything that both these main monitors can't tell you will probably be covered off by the further screen that sits between the two clear instrument dials that you view through this tactile three-spoke multifunction steering wheel. Uh, this has some quite curious but endearing readouts. It'll remind you to check the back seat for anything that you might have left there when you power off, for example. But its main tasks are to cover off things like fuel usage and the settings for the adaptive cruise control system. Uh, the gauges that this smaller display sits between are of the conventional analog kind. Uh, for the time being, at least, Subaru clearly doesn't have any time for the kind of full width digital instrument cluster screens uh, that some rivals do use. Earlier we touched on the fact that the front seats aren't particularly high set. It is a touch ironic that some other less capable SUVs give you a slightly more commanding driving position. Uh, but there's not very much wrong with the design ergonomics in play here. Uh, there's certainly more than enough wheel and seat adjustment to make it easy to get comfortable. And the heated seats are well sculpted for long journey and comfort. Uh, there's a bit more elbow space up front now too, and that's thanks to an extra extra 20 millimeters of width between the seats here. And we continue to like the way that the heater controls uh, are large and chunky enough to be used by a gloved hand. Perhaps our favorite touch though, is the way that Subaru has used the technology incorporated into its latest driving monitoring system so that personal vehicle settings can be automatically activated by facial recognition. Uh, the seat position, the door mirror angle, uh, the display screen content, and the air conditioning settings can be set and synced to a recognized driver. It can remember the preferences up to uh, five different people People too. So when you get behind the wheel of your Forester, uh, absolutely everything will automatically be set just the way you like it. Neat. On to practicalities. Uh, cabin stowage is reasonable. The door pockets look a bit small and they are uh, indeed pretty narrow, but they do incorporate a forward section shaped to allow for the placement of quite large bottles. Uh, the installation of an electronic handbrake uh, below the gear stick here frees up space for a couple of horizontally orientated cup holders with an open compartment just behind. Uh, plus there's uh, this small coin recess nearby. There's a lidded storage box between the seats here. Uh, that's complete with a lift out tray. Uh, plus in the box itself, there's a 12 volt socket, although there's no USB port. There are more uh, sockets, a 12 volt, a twin USB and an aux in, in this open stowage area ahead of the gear stick. Uh, even in a variant fitted with this glass sunroof, uh, Subaru hasn't forgotten to include an overhead compartment for your sunglasses. Plus the glove box is big and and there are also small trays in the door armrests. Uh, there are ticket clips on the sun visors too. Unusually, they're positioned for some reason on the exposed surface. 
Accessibility into the back is helped by doors that open wider than those fitted to many competitor models and by lower side sills covered by the door panels to stop dirt from building up and getting clothing muddy when you're getting in and out. And once inside, well, this feels like a slightly larger SUV now, and that's mainly because this Mark 5 model's longer wheelbase has separated front and rear passengers by a further 30 millimeters. So there's a little more space for legs and knees, helped by scalloped front seat backs and front chairs that you can comfortably slide your feet beneath. Uh, this SK series model's extra body width has also made it easier to fit three adults across the rear bench, and that's something further aided by this relatively low central transmission tunnel. It is disappointing though that you can't slide the seat bases or recline the seat backs in the way that is possible with some rival models. Headroom is generally fine too, although in this sunroof equipped model there's a lowered ceiling section that eats into it. Uh, there are some lovely design touches though, the stitched door cards, the classy finishing around the cup holders which feature in the central armrest and you get these double seat back pockets and that's something that we've never seen in any other car. Uh, there are no individual overhead reading lights though and the door bins are a bit small but you do get twin central vents with two USB ports nearby plus overhead coat hooks, useful recesses in the door pulls and on this premium spec variant there's a luxury of heated rear seats too. Let's finish with a look at luggage capacity, uh, accessed via a rear hatch that on this top premium variant is, as you can see, power operated. Uh, we'd hope that this Mark V model's bigger dimensions would have done quite a lot to improve levels of boot space, which are previously a touch restricted by class standards. Uh, as it turns out, the room available here has risen by just 15 litres to a 520 litre total. That figure no doubt compromised a bit by the need to cite the e-boxer hybrid systems lithium-ion battery beneath this cargo area floor. To give you some class perspective on the capacity figure we just gave you, uh, the model that's arguably this Forester's closest rival, the Toyota RAV4 hybrid, offers 580 litres. And the class norm amongst similarly priced premium D-segment SUVs, say Audi's Q5, is around 550 litres. Still, there are other close competitors that struggle more than this Forester does in that regard. A competing Honda CR-V hybrid will give you just 497 litres of boot space. And if you were going to go for a plug-in hybrid SUV in this segment, you get a lot less space. A Mitsubishi Outlander PHE, for example, has a 463 litre boot. The small under boot floor compartment doesn't yield much extra room. Uh, this lower space is made possible by the fact that rather disappointingly for such a capable crossover, Subaru doesn't provide any sort of temporary spare wheel, just one of those fiddly tire mobility kits. Uh, two curiously shaped bag hooks feature on each cargo sidewall, plus on the left here there's a 12 volt socket too. For some reason there is another pull out bag hook on the inner facing of the tailgate. Uh, we can't really imagine what you'd use that for actually. Uh, the designers haven't thought to include a ski hatch or a 40-20-40 seat back split so longer items can be slid in between two rear seated folk, uh, nor can the seat back angle be adjusted to accommodate bulky items. You use seat retraction catches uh, provided on either cargo area sidewall to push forward the 60-40 split folding seat backs. Once they've sprung forward, the load area revealed isn't totally flat, but it's probably as spacious as most owners will need it to be. Uh, 1,071 litres in size or 1,779 if you load up to the roof. In recent years, Subaru has been gradually pushing this Forester model line up market in order to create breathing space below for its only slightly smaller XV crossover. And the switch to full hybrid power for this fifth generation car has given the company another opportunity to nudge things up a further substantial chunk. And now the last time we tested a Forester, uh, that was the facelifted fourth generation model in 2015. This was a 25 to 30,000 pound car. At its launch in late 2019, this fifth generation design was pitched from 36,000 pounds. And that's for the cheap 
cheapest version. Ideally, you'd want the premium model we're trying here, and that costs £39,000. Now, before we look at rivals from other brands, let's price position this car for you in Subaru's own model lineup. Uh, the Forester E Boxer costs £5,000 more than the brand's slightly smaller XV E Boxer crossover model, and it costs £3,000 more than the company's Outback four wheel drive estate, which still uses a much less efficient non hybrid 2.5 litre petrol engine. Like all current Subarus, uh, this Forester can only be had with the brand's Lineatronic C. CVT automatic gearbox. Subaru will be quick to point out that the kind of money being asked here is that which is also necessary to gain ownership of decently specified versions of this car's two closest rivals, both also, like this car, full hybrids of the non-plug-in sort, the Toyota RAV4 and the Honda CR-V hybrid. It's worth pointing out, though, that both those cars can also be had with lower levels of trim, starting from around the £30,000 mark. So going for either a RAV4 or a CR-V would certainly give you more choice but choosing either one of those would leave you with a more fashion conscious SUV and one that could get nowhere near a Forester in really rough road conditions nor would a RAV4 or a CRV be able to tow as effectively so it all comes down to just how important that kind of capability is to you. Now, before we go any further, we ought to clarify the terminology here. Hybrid is a word that's banded about quite a bit these days, and it's easy to get confused. Very often at present, it designates MHEV or mild hybrid technology. That's the sort of thing that you get in this class, for example, in a Ford Cougar, which sees a normal combustion engine only very marginally electrified by a tiny battery positioned under the rear seat. To be frank, it doesn't make a great deal of difference. Full hybrid engines, uh, usually petrol powered, are very different and unlike mild hybrids, they can switch to full electrification in city motoring. Now there are two kinds of full hybrid. There's a so-called self-charging variety, which as we just said, is what you'll get in the Subaru, uh, as well as in the Toyota RAV4 and the Honda CR-V models we just mentioned. Uh, these are units that can't be plugged in, but which have large batteries that can more frequently help out the engine than is possible possible with mild hybrid EV tech. The other sort of full hybrid power plant is that of the plug-in PHEV. Here you get a larger battery still and one that can be plugged in to give you 25 to 30 miles of fully electric zero emissions motoring before the engine cuts in. Now Forrester Money would get you the market leader when it comes to mid-sized plug-in crossovers, uh, the Mitsubishi Outlander PHEV. Plus, in the same kind of cost bracket, Toyota are now offering a plug-in version of the RAV4 and you can get a PHEV version of the Seat Taraco too. Alternatively, uh, what you'd pay for this Subaru would also get you a better specified version of a fractionally smaller plug-in SUV. Uh, there are now pricey PHEV versions of the Peugeot 3008, uh, the Vauxhall Grandland X, the Citroen C5 Aircross and the Ford Cougar. Or if you're prepared to pay a little more than Subaru's asking here and push your spend well into the 40 to 50,000 pound bracket, well, then you can get a plug-in version of the BMW X3, the Mercedes GLC, the Audi Q5 and the DS7 Crossback. The bottom line, though, is that none of the cars we've just mentioned have the kind of established off-road and towing credentials that you get with a Forester. And that might be enough to attract your interest. And if so, well, then you're going to need to know just how generous Subaru has been with the standard spec here. So let's take a look at that now. Now, as you want, all the serious 4x4 stuff comes as standard, uh, primarily the symmetrical four-wheel drive system and the brand's clever X-Mode package which allows you to select a mode for the kind of terrain that you'll be travelling over and which includes hill descent control which on muddy tracks will maintain a constant speed when the car is travelling downhill. Uh, for tarmac use there's also the SI drive setup, that's Subaru Intelligent Drive, uh, basically a driving mode system which allows you to switch between a performance orientated sport setting and a more efficiency orientated intelligent mode. Uh, you get self-leveling rear suspension too, and that'll be helpful if you're carrying really heavy loads. 
As for more familiar kit items, well, the standard model comes with 17-inch alloy wheels, full LED headlamps with high beam assist, uh, LED front fog lights, power folding heated mirrors, UV protection glass, roof rails, headlamp washers, uh, keyless entry, a windscreen wiper, de-icing element, and a Thatcham Category 1 alarm, plus a whole package of EyeSight driver assistance technology. Uh, we'll get onto that in just a moment, though. Disappointingly, you don't get any kind of spare wheel though. Inside with the standard model uh, there are front seats with heat, eight-way power adjustability and with selectable memory settings plus you get dual zone automatic air conditioning too. Uh, there is also adaptive cruise control, aluminium pedals and a rear view camera to go with the standard rear parking sensors. Infotainment provision is taken care of by the Subaru infotainment and audio system with its 8-inch colour touchscreen and that's the portal via which you access the 6-speaker DAB stereo system and use the Bluetooth phone functionality. Uh, the package includes Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, uh, voice recognition, dual USB ports and an aux in jack. Uh, find the £3,000 premium that Subaru requires for this car's premium trim and of course you get a lot more. Uh, the seats gain full leather upholstery and they're also heated in the rear. Uh, the Subaru infotainment system has SD card navigation and there's a power sliding glass sunroof and an electrically operated tailgate plus rear privacy glass, a heated steering wheel and larger 18 inch alloy wheels. Now, if you think that £3,000 sounds quite a lot to add in those features, we wouldn't disagree. On to options. Uh, whichever the two trim levels you go for, bear in mind that unless you want your Forester finished in crystal white, uh, you'll have to pay £550 more for what's called special paint finishes. They're basically the various pearl and metallic shades that the brand offers. And if you want to go further than that in personalising your car, there are, of course, plenty of desirable extras. Um, if you are a typical active Forester buyer, then you'll want to know about the usual tow bars, the roof racks, the roof boxes and the roof carriers for skis and kayaks. Uh, there is also a bike carrier for the roof uh, or one that clips onto the back of the tailgate and can take an e-bike or up to three if needed. Uh, plus you can specify steel or aluminium engine underguards for a rough off-road work. A rear differential underguard is also available. Uh, what about interior practical options? Well, a dirt bag in grey or brown can be specified to suspend hammock-like between the front seat backs and the rear seat facings to protect the rear compartment against luggage or pet damage. Uh, you can specify interior scuff plates for the door openings, door entry protection foil, a set of rubber interior mats and a coat hanger that clips onto the front seat backs. Uh, door visors in black or with a chrome moulding are available to allow you to open the windows during unsettled weather. Um, in the boot area you can specify extra LED illumination. These are lights that shine down from the inner sides of the tailgate when it's raised to uh, illuminate anything when you're trying to load up at night. Uh, you might also want the luggage divider that will separate the cargo area from the uh, passenger compartment. An extra vertical net can subdivide the boot, uh, plus there are deep and shallow cargo trays. You can have a rear seat back protector. Uh, there is an anti-slip boot floor mat available and you can add a cargo management box too. Step panels to protect the rear loading lip from scuffs and scrapes are available in resin black or silver or in stainless steel. Or you can have the boot flap which folds out across the bumper to do the same job. If you want to personalise the look of your Forester, there are various aesthetic embellishments that you can add. Uh, the orange foil that can be applied to the mirror covers and just below the roof rails, for example. Plus, you can add a lower side decoration foil. A black honeycomb panel can be added onto the front grille. And black 18-inch alloy wheels can be had too. Uh, some of the available extras have a protective function. The foil covers for the door mirrors, uh, the 
the door handles and for the bonnet, for example. Uh, you can also add front and rear splash guards, side protection strips, bumper corner protectors and front parking sensors. For the interior, you can add blue interior illumination, premium carpet mats, uh, stainless steel side sill plates and a welcome light that projects the Subaru logo onto the ground at night when you open the door. There is also a cigarette lighter kit if you haven't yet kicked the habit. Onto safety, which is an area where big strides have been made with this fifth generation design. Now a major failing with the old Forester was that it hadn't been engineered to incorporate the latest camera driven safety kit, which buyers increasingly now expect. Uh, this Mark V model emphatically puts that right, moving from the bottom to the top of the class in this regard, courtesy of Subaru's impressively complete package of EyeSight driver assistance technology, all of which comes fitted as standard across the range. Now the brand has now produced well over a million EyeSight equipped vehicles and a recent study by the Institute for Traffic Accident Research and Data Analysis in Japan found that Subaru models which are fitted with EyeSight were 61% less likely to have an accident than those without it. Looking detail at how the system works and it quickly becomes clear why that is. The setup uses two stereo cameras, one mounted either side of the rear view mirror to monitor the road for up to 110 meters ahead as you drive. Uh, these then are used to capture three dimensional color images, which are nearly as sharp as those seen through the human eye, hence the system's name. Now that extra accuracy makes quite a difference. Other similar camera driven safety systems, uh, they can only recognize upcoming hazards as vague unidentified obstacles. In contrast, the EyeSight cameras can specifically recognize vehicles, motorbikes, um, bicycles, pedestrians and lane markings. As the car moves closer to the potential hazard, the EyeSight setup takes an image from each camera and compares those images to determine your closing distance to that object. Uh, software decisions can then be made in the blink of an eye to either warn you to take avoiding action or to autonomously apply braking so that an accident can either be completely avoided or its severity significantly reduced. Uh, that is basically how the EyeSight autonomous braking setup works. Subaru calls it pre-collision braking, but five other systems are also provided as standard on this car using that EyeSight technology. So we'll run you through those now. At highway cruising speeds, adaptive cruise control will automatically regulate your distance to the car in front. Um, lane keep assist, that will apply gentle steering correction if at over 40 miles an hour you're about to deviate over the road lane markings. Lane sway and departure warning will give you visual and audible warnings if the car gets caught by a gust of wind or if it departs its lane without indicating. Lead vehicle start alert will prompt you if you're stopped in a traffic queue and you haven't noticed that the vehicle in front has started to move. And pre-collision throttle management, well that will warn you if if you select drive instead of reverse when the car is facing an obstacle, say if it's parked facing a wall for example, and it'll cut the engine to prevent an impact. And there's more, uh, both Forrester variants also get Subaru's rear vehicle detection system package, which includes three more key features. Blind spot monitoring works on the move if you're about to pull out in front of another vehicle. Lane change assist, uh, that works on the highway to warn you if another vehicle is approaching uh, the rear of a car in a neighboring lane. Uh, and also rear cross traffic alert, that warns you of approaching traffic when you're reversing out of a parking space. It's all really reassuring. With this fifth generation Forester, Subaru has at last got around to introducing a driver monitoring system. That's one of those setups that periodically checks your reactions for drowsiness. Uh, competitor products have had that sort of feature for ages, but the Japanese maker has taken the opportunity here to further develop it with more advanced facial recognition technology. If when you're on the move and you're at the wheel, you look out of the window or you look across at a passenger for too long a period of time, then the system will 
recognize that your face direction isn't forward and it'll uh, sound a warning and alert you to focus on the road ahead. Now, like other such systems, this one will also search for signs of drowsiness and that's based on your reactions and how frequently you're blinking or closing your eyes. Uh, if something is detected, then it'll mute the audio system and make sure that you uh, can't ignore the warnings that it'll give you. We should also make the point that this fifth generation SK series Forester is also a fundamentally stronger and safer car than it was before. Body strength has been increased by 40%, allowing this car's special ring-shaped reinforcement frame to absorb more energy in the event of a collision and to disperse it more widely beneath the seating compartment. Uh, in addition, both Forrester variants uh, now get steering responsive LED headlights which turn with the bends and dip themselves at night in the face of oncoming traffic. Uh, we also like the reverse automatic braking feature. Now that will not only warn you if you're just about to reverse into something uh, or someone of course, but it can also automatically apply the brakes to avoid a costly impact if for some reason you fail to respond to the audible warnings of the rear bumper's force sensors. Uh, the result of all this has been a string of safety awards for this car around the world and as expected it's gained a full five-star rating by independent assessors Euro NCAP. Plus of course the previous model's full suite of more traditional safety features have been carried over. A little disappointingly European spec models don't get the pedestrian protection airbag which is standard on some Subaru sold in Japan but you do of course get the usual front side and curtain airbags plus a driver's knee bag and you'll find the usual electronic aids for traction and stability control to hopefully ensure that you never have to use those. Uh, there is also a brake assist feature built into the four sensor full channel ABS system to maximize deceleration in emergency stops and there's hill start assist to uh, stop you from drifting backwards when you're pulling away on an uphill junction. A safety pedal setup prevents foot injuries and crashes and there are also anti-whiplash head restraints and ice fix child seat fastenings. In short it all adds up to a very complete safety showing uh, which most rivals in this class can't get close to matching. Let's say right at the beginning that you do well to keep your expectations in check here. Uh, this Forester might now be a full hybrid, but it also refuses to compromise on the rugged off-road ability, which has always characterized this model line, and hopefully, which always will. Hence this Subaru's always on symmetrical permanent four wheel drive setup, uh, the kind of thing that you don't find on most rivals who prefer part time four wheel drive systems that keep you front driven for most of the time. There are also other reasons why the Subaru brand hasn't generally been the one that your company accountant would ideally recommend. Uh, most of this manufacturer's previous models have tended to be on the heavy side and virtually all of them have featured boxer engines with a reputation of being, well, rather fond of a drink. This car's Boxer power plant though claims to be different, a full hybrid that mates the brand's usual 2 litre direct injection flat 4 petrol unit with a lithium ion battery that's sited beneath the boot floor. This setup allows for pure electric driving at urban speeds of up to 25 miles an hour, although only from about a mile and only if you've selected the EV orientated EV driving mode, that's one of the three selectable driving settings. It's all a far cry from the 25 to 30 mile EV range that you'll get from a comparably priced plug-in hybrid model. Still, you don't have the hassle here of continually having to attach a dirty charging lead to the mains. And this self-charging hybrid setup is certainly very clever in the way that it seamlessly shunts between electric and petrol power as you drive in the motor assist driving setting that we're using most frequently in this car. That combination mode is the one that the official efficiency stats are based around, uh, which depend on selection of the more frugal of the two SI drive modes, uh, Intelligent, and which for the record are 34.7 mpg on the WLTP combined cycle and 154 grams per kilometre of NEDC rated CO2. 
Curiously, those stats don't alter with the larger 18-inch wheels that are fitted to the plusher premium spec model we're trying here, and they mean you'll be incurring a top 37% tax liability with this car, which might come as disappointing news given that uh, lowering of tax liabilities is one of the main reasons that buyers tend to switch to hybrid power. It is also annoying that the decently sized 63-litre fuel tank fitted to the smaller XV model doesn't feature here uh, to give you a decent touring range. The tank on a Forester e-boxer is just 48 litres inside and that's presumably another casualty of the bulky hybrid system. We didn't expect this Subaru's fuel and CO2 figures to exactly match those of its two closest rivals, uh, self-charging hybrid versions of the Honda CR-V and the Toyota RAV4. Uh, those cars don't have the off-road capability of this one after all. We did though rather hope that the e-boxer engine technology would allow this Forester to edge a little closer to the class benchmark than it has. To give you some class perspective, an all-wheel drive CR-V hybrid manages 38.7 mpg and 126 grams per kilometre, while an all-wheel drive RAV4 hybrid manages 48.7 mpg and 103 grams per kilometre. We had anticipated that the somewhat portly curb weight would be one reason why this Subaru's figures might lag behind those two rivals, but interestingly, both the Honda and the Toyota actually weigh more than a Forester. Obviously then, that symmetrical permanent four-wheel drive setup is the key differentiating factor. As a result, without the e-boxer technology plus a flat four power plant's standard stop-start system, high compression ratios and low levels of internal friction, the running cost figures of this car wouldn't be even remotely competitive. As it is, you might well take the view that the uh, remaining discrepancy isn't much to have to bear for the peace of mind which inevitably comes with this car extra poor weather capability. Plus, it is certainly true that the rest of the running cost orientated news that we have to deliver here is pretty positive. Uh, for a start, a Forester might conceivably cost you a little less than those two direct rivals to insure. It's rated at group 20p in standard form or 21p if you go for this top premium spec model. Uh, residuals tend to be strong on Subaru models and this one is no different. After three years and 30,000 miles, uh, this top Forester premium model would still be worth £19,675 and that's a very decent retained value. Servicing intervals are every 12,000 miles or every year, whichever comes first, and there's the peace of mind of a five-year, 100,000-mile warranty, which embarrasses the three-year, 60,000-mile package that most rivals offer. Uh, you also get a three-year recovery and roadside assistance program that you'll almost certainly never need. Nothing comes for nothing, and it still doesn't if you add electrification into the mix. Now, if you'd hoped rather unrealistically that the switch to a hybrid engine would give you a Subaru Forester's off-road capability with the running costs of a soft-roading fashionist arrival, then you'll be disappointed here because it doesn't. The bottom line is that an SUV that's properly engineered to get you through the worst driving conditions is never going to be quite as efficient to run as one that isn't, or as light and agile to drive either. We had hoped though that the switch to the e-boxer engine and the stiffer Subaru Global platform might have brought this Mark V Forester a little closer to the class standard in both these areas that it actually has. Still, the improvements that have been developed in those areas are welcome. And for someone who previously really wanted an upper mid-sized SUV with this Forester's capability, but who couldn't quite justify the thought of one, well, they could be just about enough to push them over the edge into Subaru ownership. Well, that's the brand's hope anyway. Plenty of other things that might have put you off in the previous generation version of this car have also been sorted. So media connectivity is now properly up to scratch and the cabin at last feels of reasonable quality. Of course, this Subaru still isn't perfect. You might well be disappointed by the lack of engine and transmission choice and the boot could be bigger. 
We're also a little disappointed to see just how much pricing has risen. Subaru can reference this against rival models all it likes, but the truth is that just a few generations ago, it would have been almost inconceivable that the Forester would one day be a £40,000 car. These things needn't be deal breakers though, and for many loyal buyers, they certainly won't dilute this model's many refreshingly honest virtues. Most hybrid SUVs are in some way compromised when it comes to things like towing and off-roading. This one isn't. Now true, it doesn't have the kind of electric capability that you get from a plug-in rival, but you may not need that. And if you don't, then this Mark V Forester's mix of old school toughness and new generation technology might be right up your street. Now the company's earliest models were sold alongside farm machinery and beneath the plush polish you get in today's Forester, a bit of that same rugged appeal still remains. You won't want to be constantly reminded of that though when you're merely on the school run and in this fifth generation Forester, you're not. It's fashionable without being trendy and it's built to last while never feeling utilitarian. In short, it's the kind of car it really ought to be, a vehicle in which four-wheel drive is fundamental rather than simply an optional extra. And as a result, it's one of the best SUVs in this class to buy if you really plan on using it to its full potential. True, the result may not be as smoothly cultured as less capable rivals, but when conditions worsen, you won't care about that. And you'll probably be really glad that you chose one of these.